Was the judge within his rights? Yes, is the short answer, but I have to say I was stunned by this because generally speaking, judges do stay somewhat within the guidelines that are recommended. This was a massive departure. I mean, you're talking about getting a fraction of what the sentencing guidelines recommended. Now, the sentencing guidelines don't have the teeth they used to. When I was a young lawyer for the 20 minutes I actually practiced law, the sentencing guidelines really were mandatory and judges hated them because they took away their discretion. And the whole reason we had the sentencing guidelines guidelines in the first place was because there was this disparity where sometimes white collar criminals would get off easy, other people wouldn't, and they were trying to bring uniformity into sentencing across this country. Well now because of Supreme Court decisions, the guidelines are largely discretionary and now you see a situation like this where you look at what the judge had before him, yes he's within his rights, yes he's allowed to use his discretion, but this is a massive departure from someone who A, did not show any remorse, he showed a lot of sympathy for himself in the courtroom and the judge noted that and someone who this judge knows broke a plea deal and another judge found had lied in the mid post indictment post conviction so why this is this no matter where your political leanings are no matter how you feel about the evidence in the case where the judge decides that this is the case where I'm gonna do a massive downward departure from what the guidelines recommend I mean I have to say I'm scratching my head and I I'm I'm trying to I want to understand I get it he said an otherwise blameless life he looked at some of that you can tell this judge is not a fan of the special counsel by some of the statements that he said he feels like the special counsel is over his skis here far outside the scope but but um, yeah, I think it's a stunner, no matter how you slice it. Barbara, you were more than stunned. You called the sentence atrociously low. Does it reflect poorly on Robert Mueller's team going forward and the investigation and what they face? Um, I don't think it will derail them. I do worry that it does send a message mm -hmm. to other would-be cooperators <laughs> that uh, just stay the course, go to trial. If Even if you're convicted, you're not going to get a lot of prison time. I, I don't think, though, that that is uh, a likely scenario for most defendants because I don't think you can count on every judge to be as lenient as Judge Ellis was here. Judge Ellis is exactly the kind of judge for which the sentencing guidelines were created to pr protect against those kinds of unwarranted disparities and outlier cases, but it is an outlier, and I think most judges uh, that are going to be assigned a case are far more likely to comply with those sentencing guidelines, and so I am I'm hopeful that it won't uh, derail anyone who is interested in cooperating. And then again, of course, there is also the backstop of uh, the, the sentence from Judge Jackson next week in Washington, D.C. She can sentence Paul Manafort to up to an additional 10 years consecutive to these four years. So he could still be looking at 14 years. And also with regard to this idea that, you know, the statement that Manafort's lawyer said with, there is no evidence of collusion with government officials from Russia. It's a very specific thing to state. Um, and it doesn't uh, uh, mean that there is not collusion with other individuals who are not government officials from ah. Russia, such as Konstantin Kalimnik, who Robert Mueller has accused of being uh, an intelligence uh, officer from Russia. So I think there is more the redactions from the documents suggest that Robert Mueller and his team continue to investigate links to Russia. Uh, the cigar bar meeting uh, with Manafort and Kalimnik, for example, are still out there. And so I don't think we've reached the end of the road with regard to conspiracy with Russia. Could be Oleg Deripaska, who we have to remember, Paul Manafort, was in the hole to, to the tune of $19 million when he joined the campaign, and Oleg's business had been strangled due to Russian sanctions. Midwin, in 2017, the U.S. Sentencing Commission looked at the average prison term in Virginia's Eastern District. So we have the average sentence for fraud, three years. Gun-related charges, five and a half years. Drug trafficking, seven years. Is the issue that Manafort got an unusually low sentence because it was Manafort or that white-collar criminals kind of get hooked up? White-collar criminals kind of get hooked up. And it's unfortunate. And I think this is important for all of America to see. And I've been saying all along since the Mueller investigation this is that this is sort of uh, uh, shining a spotlight on how the, the justice system treats some people and how it treats others. And defense attorneys such as myself have always said that the justice system in many ways is unjust to certain people. When you look at, for example, Khalif Browder, a young black man who spent three years in jail simply for an alleged 
stealing of a backpack, never convicted. When you look at uh, Crystal Mason in Texas, who has been sentenced to five years in jail for voting while on probation. And when you look at Wesley Snipes, right, also a wealthy man, also an actor, but also black, spent, was sentenced to three years in jail for misdemeanors, three misdemeanors, for failing to file a tax return. So this disparity is something that we've been seeing for a long time in the criminal justice system, and it's not surprising. But it's unfortunate because when you look at the number of crimes that Manafort has committed, and you went through a lengthy explanation of just how flagrant and repeated. For years. For years. And the idea that someone like this would get such a downward departure is really unjust. Yamish, Rudy Giuliani keeps attacking federal prosecutors, despite the fact that the judge gave them the best possible outcome. What's the Giuliani strategy here? Well, the Giuliani strategy is really to continue vilifying the special counsel investigation and to continue to, to, to show or to argue that the president is someone who's blameless and all, everybody around him are being picked on because essentially it comes down to people are mad that President Trump got elected. I've been texting with Rudy Giuliani this morning and he, mm. wrote, he wrote to me just this morning, the sentence was a lot less than the angry Democrats wanted. Um, they should be ashamed of their horrendous treatment of Paul Manafort, who they pressured relentlessly because unlike Michael Cohen, he wouldn't lie for them. Now, that's Rudy Giuliani saying that the prosecutors were looking for a specific sentence. We know that the prosecutors weren't looking for a specific sentence, but as Savannah very smartly laid out, one-fifth of the lowest possible sentence, you know that that means prosecutors have to be angry. And people that were in the court describe prosecutors looking gaunt and looking angry at, at the sentence once it was read. So we know that here we have, I think, this Trump machine going, getting around Paul Manafort saying he's a good guy that's being picked on because of his relationship with Trump. And it, it is important to note that Paul Manafort might not have been in this trouble had he never gotten involved in the Trump campaign. That's very true that if he was just one of the other people in D.C. that might be doing the same thing that he's doing, he might have been able to get away with this for another 20 years. But it doesn't mean he's not a criminal. Okay. Exactly. These white collar criminals, don't, we, we don't go after them. Savannah, here's what stuck out to me. At the beginning of the hearing, the judge made a point to say this has nothing to do with Russia collusion, Russian collusion. And then after... Paul, Paul Manafort's lawyer, when he was at the podium, said the same thing. Take a listen. Mr. Manafort finally got to speak for himself. He made clear he accepts responsibility for his conduct. And I think most importantly, what you saw today is the same thing that we had said from day one. There is absolutely no evidence that Paul Manafort was involved with any collusion with any government official from Russia. We got you. He wasn't on trial for that. Mm. Why do they keep going back to this OK, point? I'm going to give you two interpretations. Back one, all right, and, and you can decide which one you like, OK? <laughs> Maybe the lawyer and the judge who made the same kind of remark, they, you know, the collusion was not at, at, at issue here. Maybe they're trying to say, look, Robert Mueller, in these cases against Paul Manafort, they are so far outside the scope of what Mueller's initial commission was uh, to go search for collusion, which is the catch all term we use now. But as we all know, it's actually conspiracy. So maybe that's what they're saying. That is a generous interpretation. Maybe that lawyer is out there on the courthouse steps auditioning for a pardon from President Trump, who when he hears no collusion, it must be like the tinkling of a little bell. He loves <laughs> he says it. He loves to say it. Rudy's saying it. Everybody's saying it all the time. So I mean, I think there's two different ways to look at it. But yes, so far, Robert Mueller has brought a case that has to do with conspiracy that goes to the heart of what he was commissioned to do when he was assigned to be special counsel. On the other hand, if the special counsel in the course of investigating that very collusion runs across crimes, he isn't supposed to give a pass to them. He's supposed to prosecute them or farm them out to other jurisdictions or hold them for himself and take them to, to prosecution or to trial. So that's what he's supposed to do. He's not supposed to be like, well, that wasn't on my list of to do, so we'll just let Look that the one other slide. Way. That's, by the way, I'm, and I'd like to go back to your business background, that's exactly how they ran into the Martha Stewart case. They were investigating something else and ran across her her situation and with the I should say, trading. I, I had a source, a legal source, as soon as the special counsel was announced, said the thing, the reason why people hate special counsel investigations right. is because they can go through all different other sorts of avenues, even if it's not the original intent. And when it comes to someone like President Trump and all the people around him, money is going to be a key thing that gets these people in trouble. Yeah. That was about a year and a half ago. That right. source has been yeah. completely dead on because yeah. that's exactly what's been By happening. By the way, ask Bill Clinton how he feels about special counsel, exactly. or special prosecutor investigations. That's exactly. the problem. 
once they start, who knows what's going to turn up when they start digging into things. Right. And what's, yeah. what's glaring here also is that Manafort has committed these crimes over decades. What was the Southern District of New York doing all of this time? What were all these prosecutors doing all of this time? One of the, one of the I think, takeaways from the statement that attorney made from the, from the steps uh, outside the courthouse. Which people don't have to worry about the law? Exactly. Exactly. Like, leave us alone, buddy. Like, this is this is par for the course. This is what we do. And the idea that Mueller was busy poking around, he didn't find what he was specifically tasked with looking at, which is Russia collusion. But all this other stuff, listen, this is boys will be boys. This is what we do. But Midwin, what did you what think, think about saying? the judge saying he lived an otherwise blameless life when you're talking about charges that go back a decade? decade. Martha well, Stewart led an otherwise blameless life. Paul Manafort didn't. Well, what's interesting? Interesting in that, I, I, I found astonishing because essentially what the judge was saying is he had, Manafort had never been caught. In other words, he had done all these things, but he had never been caught, and so therefore he lived an otherwise blameless life. Which, so it's a very interesting way to look at it. Which goes back to those disparities in the courthouse. Exactly. When you talk to lawyers like yourself and others, they say that once, even the idea of how race and, and gender and, and class play into the court system, when you walk into that courtroom, does a judge look at you and say, well, this young man who maybe got caught stealing $100 worth of quarters, quarters. At, the laundry, at the laundry department, um, at the laundry mat, does that person live an otherwise blameless life? Life, or do I already look at that person and say, well, he's part of a problem. I've seen other people that look like him, so he deserves right. to have 72 months, which is what a lawyer tweeted yeah, just, right. just yesterday. Can we just throw one fact yes. also onto the table? Because you just showed the statistics in the Eastern District of Virginia, what the you know different kinds of cases mm -hmm. and what they get. It did show a fraud case. The average is three years. Okay, Manafort gets four. One of the judge's rationales was that these kinds of cases the, the sentence he gave to Manafort was in line with what those kinds of cases in his jurisdiction get. So that's what his rationale was. It seems to be borne out by the facts that you spent all night researching. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.